Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Near the end of the introduction to her work, The Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir is going to lay her cards on the table, so to speak, and set out some of the outlines of her existentialist approach to this question of the relation between men and women. And this is going to be quite critical of other approaches which frame things in terms, you might say, of a zero-sum solution. So she talks about people who have, have screwed up the, the, you know, the women question, right? She says it's because it's been turned into a quarrel, and when we quarrel, we no longer reason well. People have tirelessly sought to prove that woman is superior, inferior, equal to man. She gives some examples of arguments made on this basis. One prime example is that of the relation between Adam and Eve, right? You could say, well, Adam is first, and whatever comes first must be the best. <clears throat> Eve is merely derivative of Adam, so therefore she's inferior. Or you might say, on the opposite side, listen, when you make a first try at something, it's usually not as good. So obviously, Adam was just God's first attempt, and Eve is the much better, newer model that you know took into account the flaws of the first one. And, and she goes on and she says, listen, um, these arguments at once suggest their opposites, and both are often fallacious. This is not getting us anywhere. And why is it that the only options before us would be women are superior to men, women are inferior to men, or women are equal to men? Is that really the entire gamut of, of possibilities? She doesn't think so. And so she says that what we need to do is discard these vague notions of superiority, inferiority, and equality because they've corrupted every discussion of the subject and we should begin afresh. So how would we do this? She points out that men have been both the, the uh, judge, he says, and party to the case of the relationship between men and women. But then again, so have women. So it's not like men or women can genuinely be impartial in this matter. So what, what if we found some third position, something perhaps different, you know, an angel, she says. Um, we would need some sort of angel who is neither man nor woman, perhaps not even bodily. And she says, well, to begin with, where are you gonna find that? But even if you did, how the hell would that help you? Such a creature wouldn't have enough knowledge about the conditions that we actually live in to adjudicate the case. What if instead you found some sort of in-between? She talks about the hermaphrodite as a possibility. You know, Hermes, Aphrodite, male, female together. And she says, with the hermaphrodite, we'd be no better off because the situation is peculiar. The hermaphrodite is not really the combination of an entire man and an entire woman, but rather parts of each and thus is neither. And she says, it looks to me as if there are certain women who are best qualified to elucidate the situation of women, but that doesn't help us all that much. So what do we have to do? We have to lay our cards on the table. She says, it's doubtless impossible to approach any human problem with a mind free of bias. The way in which questions are put, the points of view assumed, presupposed a relativity of interest. All characteristics imply values. Every objective description implies an ethical background. So instead of pretending that we have a view from nowhere about the relationship between men and women, and we have this purely objective standpoint, she suggests taking the standpoint of existentialist ethics, like that which she developed <clears throat> in her work, 
uh, the ethics of ambiguity and in other places as well. Now, one thing to point out about this that we're going to get to a little bit later is that this is going to prioritize freedom over happiness as a fundamental criterion. And it's also going to be oriented towards the individual and not just the individual as part of a group. So she goes on and she says, what we should do is state our principles at the beginning. So this will make it unnecessary to specify in just what sense one uses words like superior, inferior, better, worse, progress, reaction. If we do that from the start, then maybe these words come to assume a different, richer meaning. So de Beauvoir is an existentialist. What does that mean for us? She says, um, well, when it comes to the interest of people, she says that if we sur survey works on women, we note that one of the points of view most frequently adopted is that of the public good, the general interest. And one almost always means by this the benefit of society as one wishes it to be maintained or established. She's not saying that that's no good, but she's saying that's not her point of view. <clears throat> Instead, what is her point of view? She says, we hold that the only public good is that which assures the private good of the citizens. We shall pass judgment on institutions according to their effectiveness in giving concrete opportunities to individuals. So if you want to say that, for example, public education is something that we ought to be supporting and we ought to do whatever we can to make it better, to resist those who want to get rid of it or simply privatize it, you don't look just at what the aggregate result is. You have to look at how it actually affects individual human beings. What does it afford to them? What possibilities does it open up for them? And she goes on and she says, <clears throat> I'm not going to confuse the idea of private interest with that of happiness because that's another common point of view. Instead, it's going to be the point of view of freedom. So another key aspect to this is what she calls transcendence. And this is coming out of existentialism as well. Human beings are a kind of weird mix between imminence, which is the, the reality as we have it right here, which for her, she views as connected with stagnation. If we, if we treat ourselves just as we are, just in our being, just as objects, then we're trying to hold ourselves to be sort of like this piece of chalk, just what it is, nothing more, no potentialities beyond what's already in there. And when we do that sort of thing, we're denying our status as human beings, which are the, the particular kinds of beings that can transcend their situations. And this is what our freedom consists in. So she goes on and she says, um, here we go. Every subject plays his part as such specifically through exploits or projects that serve as a mode of transcendence. In creating this video, for example, in trying to explicate uh, Simone de Beauvoir's thoughts, I am transcending. I am going beyond. In, in trying to understand her on your end, but perhaps by means of this video, perhaps by means of getting rid of it uh, and just reading the book directly, you're doing something similar as well. She goes on and says, a human being achieves liberty only through a continual reaching out towards other liberties. It's never a finished thing. Our being, our essence is always something in determination. So she says, there is no justification for present existence other than its expansion into an indefinitely open future. Every time, there's another key point, transcendence falls back into imminence, stagnation. There is a degradation of existence into the aswa. That's a uh, particular term that's used by Sartre to mean in itself, being in itself, something that just is what it is. And she says the brutish life of subjection to given conditions and of liberty and con to constraint and contingence. So she says this downfall represents a moral fault if the subject consents to it. If this is imposed upon them and you consent to it, that is a problem. She says uh, if it's inflicted upon the person, it spells frustration and oppression. And then she says in both cases, it's an absolute evil. 
Every individual concerned to justify their existence feels their existence involves an undefined need to transcend oneself, to engage in freely chosen projects. So that's the existentialist ethics there in you know, sort of a nutshell. <clears throat> How does that apply to women? She talks about the drama of women, and it consists, she says, in this conflict between the fundamental aspirations of every subject who always regards the self as the essential and the compulsion of a situation in which she is the inessential. She says the situation of woman is that on the one hand, she's a free and autonomous being like all human creatures, but she finds herself living in a world in which she is in which men compel her to assume the status of the other. She says they propose to stabilize her as an object and to doom her to imminence since her transcendence is to be overshadowed and forever transcended by another ego, another self, which is the male. <clears throat> so on the one hand, a woman is treated as if she is a full human being capable of transcendence. On the other hand, that transcendence is being harnessed you might say, so that it can serve another transcendence. And she's being treated as an object. This doesn't just have to do with what we call sexual objectification. It happens anytime that a mother is reduced just to a piggy bank and the person who cleans and cooks. Or uh, the, any, anytime that you know a woman is uh, offered the chance to engage in the female gaze and be the one objectifying the peacock male. We could go on and on and on about examples of this sort of thing. But de Beauvoir sees this as the essential problem. And resolving this is going to require us to get beyond these obsessions with whether men and women as classes are superior, inferior, or equal to each other, and to think about concrete cases and relationships in which we can still use these terms of superior, inferior, and equal, but in which they're going to assume a richer and deeper meaning. 